This is the eighth meeting of criminal law. Our Prince and Olson cases illustrate the importance of recognizing that the mens rea, or culpability requirement, can vary from one material element to another within one and the same defined offense. The Model Penal Code proposes a general framework for determining the culpability required as to each material element of an offense. Across jurisdictions and over time, actual courts have spun out opinions in which certain types of attendant circumstance elements have often been held to require a lesser level of culpability or no culpability at all. These include the age of a victim or a co-participant, the quantity or precise type of a controlled substance, the official or employment status of a victim, proximity to a sensitive location such as a school or airport, and the unregistered, untaxed, or unlicensed status of a regulated item. As we have learned, this means that defenses of ignorance and mistake are cut off as to those elements. We have to be alert to the divergence of the model penal code and the law of the various jurisdictions. Courts in a jurisdiction frequently dispense with culpability where the model penal code would require it. Now we begin an excursion into federal law with the case of Morissette versus the United States a case that Justice Robert Jackson says could have remained a profoundly insignificant case as to all except its immediate parties. The defendant, Morissette, appealed a sentence of two months or a fine of $200. He could have been sentenced to up to one year in prison and a fine of $1,000. This is what we will call his exposure. He was convicted of knowing conversion of U.S. property. He admits the taking, but wants the jury to know that he thought nobody wanted the spent artillery casings he had collected from a firing range in the desert. He appeals on the ground that over his counsel's objection, the jury was given erroneous instructions. To wit, the question on intent is whether or not he intended to take the property. Why would the defendant object to this? The reason is that the instruction does not require the jury to find that what the defendant took was known to him not to have been abandoned. The defendant's mistake wasn't that he didn't know he was taking something. It was that he didn't know it was still of value to the United States. As always, we want to look carefully at the language of the statute under which the accused is charged. Whoever embezzles, steals, purloins, or knowingly converts to his use or the use of another, or without authority, sells, conveys, or disposes of any record, voucher, money, or thing of value to the United States, etc. We notice that there is culpability language in the statute, the adverb knowingly. The argument for the defense is, in effect, that this language applies to the attendant circumstance of value to the United States. At common law, under either the moral wrong approach or the lesser crime approach, either one, this should be an easy case. There's nothing wrong, morally or legally, with collecting abandoned property. The case is also easy under the model penal code. The culpability term knowingly spreads to all material elements unless that element is set apart or a contrary purpose plainly appears. The portion of the opinion we have assumes that the word knowingly does not apply, almost as if the word knowingly had disappeared. If the word knowingly had never been in the statute, the case is still an easy one. Under the common law, the court would know to read it back in. 
Under the model penal code, recklessness would be read in as to each material element. But in arguing for affirmance, the prosecution wants the U.S. Supreme Court to inquire further into legislative intent. What did Congress intend is the ultimate question. Did Congress intend to create a defense of ignorance or mistake? The prosecution argues that, indeed, the U.S. Congress meant to eliminate any defense of mistake or ignorance based on a belief that the thing taken had been abandoned. The prosecution argues that the statute defines a public welfare offense, a type of offense that Congress means to be prosecuted without a need to show culpability as to each of its elements. The court's response is to erect a framework for analysis when a federal criminal statute is involved, the so-called Morissette approach. This approach comes into play when, but only when, we are faced with a federal statute containing no applicable culpability language. In this circumstance, the Morissette approach classifies the statute as either what it calls a regulatory or public welfare offense or what we can call an infamous crime. Every federal statute lacking applicable culpability language goes into one or the other of these two categories. In the case of a public welfare offense, the court will conclude that the absence of applicable culpability language signifies that no culpability was intended. In the case of infamous crimes, however, the absence of culpability language simply means that Congress expected the courts to read it in, as courts traditionally have done. So this shows you the consequence of classifying a statute as one or the other. How are we to tell which kind we are faced with? The Morissette Court prescribes a factors test. A factors test is the opposite of a so-called bright line test. A bright line test looks to some single definitive factor. That one factor is decisive. By contrast, a factors test looks to multiple factors, no one of which need be decisive. A factors test can be messier. In Morissette, the factors that favor classifying a statute as a public welfare offense are these. It was lately enacted. It addresses risk creation rather than actual injury. The penalty attached for, upon a conviction is small. No stigma or a small stigma attaches to a conviction. And the act is malum prohibitum. The indicia of in infamous crimes are these. These are ancient been around forever. They address cases in which someone is actually injured. They attach a high penalty upon conviction, or the exposure is great. A stigma attaches to conviction, a serious stigma. These are malum in se offenses. Now, you may be puzzled by some of the terminology. Malum prohibitum means bad because prohibited. There's nothing inherently wrong with, say, driving a car in daytime without working headlights. In some places and times, that would not be illegal. But where it is illegal, it is wrong because prohibited. Contrast malum in se. Things that are considered malum in se are illegal because they are just plain bad. Even if there were no government or laws, it would still be wrong to murder or to rape. So under Morissette, what do we do once we've gathered up the factors? Well, 
Then it's time to do our balancing. Looking back to the statute, we note that it was enacted relatively recently. That favors counting it as a public welfare offense. On the other hand, the statute addresses an actual injury to the owner. It carries a high penalty, an exposure of up to a year in prison. The offense is very similar to other theft offenses, which are considered malum in se. Finally, there is the stigma likely to attach to someone convicted of this offense. It's not like overtime parking or taking deer out of season. The court sees the balance of factors as favoring counting the statute as belonging among the infamous crimes, as to which Congress meant the courts to read in culpability. The absence of applicable culpability language merely signals that it is meant to be read in. The Morissette approach gets the same result as the common law and the model penal code approaches, but by a different route. It is the different routes that we need to learn. To summarize, we have the common law tradition with its moral wrong principle and its lesser crime principle. We have the model penal code, which tells us to read in recklessness or spread stated culpability as to each material element. And with Morissette, we have a distinctive federal law approach. It is always helpful to know which one or which ones apply. They can lead to opposite results in a given case. We will apply the Morissette approach in our next video installment.